is uh, Andrew Sheldon in yet? I don't see him on my list here. Ron, uh, this is Andy. I'm on my wife's computer. Oh. So if you can send <laughs> back the video for Margaret Aldridge, I'll pretend to be Margaret today. Okay, you pretend to be Margaret. All right, let me see if I can. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Nona asked me to address uh, kind of a recovery environment for Amtrak coming out of the COVID crisis. And I'll start by pointing out that like almost all, or if not all, passenger transport providers, uh, Amtrak was hit very hard by this. Uh, their system-wide uh, traffic levels fell about 95%. Uh, but it was not uniform. Some uh, services were hit harder than some other services. Uh, as we know, the uh, uh, Acela Express trains quickly went effectively to zero. Uh, some of the state-sponsored uh, corridors went very close to zero. Uh, the Acelas were withdrawn uh, almost immediately uh, because nobody was riding them. And, and much the same was true of many of the state corridors, but not all of them. Uh, some retained some of their ridership. The overall system average decline was 95%. Uh, but the one segment that was much better than the average was the long distance segment. The interregional trains uh, retained about 85% of their ridership, uh, excuse me, 15% of their ridership. They were down 85%, uh, which is you know, that, that's, that's bad in absolute terms, but in comparative terms, they did really well um, in retaining traffic. So what, what do you do from that kind of a, a, a pit to try to rebuild ridership on a, on a national network? Uh, I think there's two, there's two foundational elements to that. One is to build on strength, uh, and the other is to, to follow the right metrics so that you're you're getting the, the most return on investment, uh, however you choose to measure that. And the metrics that you need to look at, I think in, in a rebuilding mode, are retained ridership, retained sales, uh, the number of intercity passengers that you're carrying, and especially the distances over which you're carrying them. Because if you're in an intercity passenger transport business, uh, the most critical metric is annual revenue passenger miles. How much transportation are you actually providing? Uh, and you need to maximize the ratio of all of these important metrics to the number of dollars that you're spending in order to accomplish it. You want to get the most RPMs per dollar spent. You want to get the, the greatest market share in the, in the corridors you're serving per dollar spent. And so far, the interregional services uh, in the COVID crisis are outperforming the short corridors by significant margins. Uh, retained traffic is three times greater than the, uh, the short corridors. Uh, in the month of May, the national interregional trains uh, had more than twice the passenger miles and revenues of the entire remainder of the system combined. Uh, we're starting to see in, in a handful of cases on the long distance trains, uh, trains leaving initial terminals in sold out conditions. It's not widespread, but it's starting to happen. Uh, and that's being driven, we think, uh, in large part by Amtrak's uh, self-assumed 50% coach capacity uh, limitation. Uh, the system is handicapped uh, in its ability to respond to demand by adding capacity. There's uh, a large number of superliner cars that are uh, leased uh, to California for Southern California uh, corridor service. Uh, it'd be very hard for Amtrak to get those back in the near term. And I'll just add my comment that the, the plan to go at the end of the summer season to three day a week service is just the classic definition of insanity that's been tried uh, several times in the past. I don't know if current management even knows that. Uh, it has never worked. Uh, each time uh, long distance trains have been eliminated or cut in frequencies, uh, the following year the system's deficit and subsidy need went up, not down. But I guess we'll have to learn that lesson again. 
at the same time, Amtrak is charging ahead with purchasing the new Acela 2 train sets, which is a $2 billion uh, exercise. Uh, those trains are intended for use in the Northeast Corridor where the, uh, the business has gone uh, for business traffic uh, as close as you can get to zero. Uh, personal travel is there, but it's light. Um, and we have no investment at all uh, planned for uh, replacing the 40 plus year old superliner fleet. So uh, it, it's a difficult proposition because management is focused on their short corridors where they get ridership numbers. Uh, we think that that uh, reflects a lot of political pressure from members of Congress from the Northeast uh, who care a lot about Amtrak because of the impact that it has on commuter traffic along the Northeast Corridor. Uh, we think it's also based on Amtrak's use of their Amtrak performance tracking system, which is a, um, a Rube Goldberg cost allocation system that they either think or represent to others uh, as being a, a reflection of the financial performance of the different trains. Uh, it's not. Uh, APT is not a financial accounting system. It's not compliant with generally accepted accounting principles. And because of that, it's incapable of and does not uh, report the financial results of operations of these different trains. So it's giving false information to management. And if Mr. Flynn thinks that uh, cutting back long distance trains to three days a week, he's gonna avoid losses, uh, he's badly mistaken. Um, but as I said, we'll probably have to learn that lesson uh, again, uh, long term, uh, trains that are positioned for single purposes or largely single purposes, uh, such as business traffic like the Acela Express, uh, are going to have a very long, hard slog to rebuild any business at all. Uh, trains that are positioned uh, purely for tourist uh, traffic, uh, we can look in Canada at Rocky Mountain Mirror or Via's uh, mostly tourist trains like the Canadian or the, uh, the ocean to Halifax uh, are also discontinued through the summer. Uh, tourism, tourism is almost non-existent. Uh, the one set of trains uh, that we know are doing well because they're general purpose trains. They, they seem to cater to people doing all kinds of travel from business travel to family business to tourism. Uh, are the interregional trains that Amtrak operates. By a huge margin, they're the strongest trains we've got. Uh, in, a, in a rational world, if we were trying to rebuild intercity rail passenger service, that's where we would start. Uh, Amtrak seems to be doing it backwards. Uh, May I Ron, say that uh, in the case of the Empire Builder in particular, we have empirical experience. There's a history on this. Uh, about uh, 30 years ago, Tom Downs, uh, I think, foolishly implemented a recommendation from Mercer Consulting to reduce the frequency of the Empire Builder to four days a week. And it was immediately recognized once they did that, that it was a financial disaster. Uh, the revenues went away. Uh, they lost more than uh, the proportional amount of revenue. Uh, the cost did not go away um, anywhere near proportionally. It was, it was just a, a complete fiasco. And the Empire Builder was brought back to daily service uh, within a year. And it took about a year beyond that for the traffic to come back. I, I won't call that a snapback, but it did come back fairly, it recovered uh, fairly quickly. And given that empirical experience, and then you've got the even stronger empirical experience of 1979 when four uh, long distance routes were eliminated altogether uh, when the financial effect was that the following year, Amtrak's corporate loss and subsidy need went up, not down. Uh, that it just, it makes you wonder, what are these people thinking? They've done this before, it's never worked. Uh, why did they think it's gonna work this time? <laughs> I really hate to interrupt these, you know, these talks really seem interesting. I mean, you should have had a lot more time, I think, for all of these. I really appreciate your input on this and the fact that you were able to 
cut this short for me because we will no, try like when, Nona, when Nona invited me to, to participate in this and said, and you get five minutes, I kind of laughed. I said, okay, you'll get headlines. You won't get thoughtful analysis. Yeah, that's my one of the problems. You just get into stuff that I'm really interested in hearing, and then I got to cut you off. So I, yeah. but, <laughs> Thank you. The way things go. Thank you very much. Well, our next person on is Gary Goyke. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, this is uh, a great effort. Um, I am going to, uh, following me, are two gentlemen that have been involved in a lot of our activities. And I'll say a little bit about them and then I'll uh, stick to my report. Um, one of the things that we have done, and Carl Schulte will explain more, is a couple of months ago, uh, through the efforts of All Aboard Wisconsin and others, we formed a COVID-19 transportation task force. And we have had, um, as a result of this, and Aran, uh, I am a big fan of Diana Moss, who is the Wisconsin Department of Transportation legislative liaison, and Ian Ritz, who handles a lot of the transit-related issues. Uh, we have talked about passenger rail on this, and within our group, we have uh, Andy Hauk, uh, Nona, and Dave uh, Muma are members of this 34 member transportation uh, COVID-19 task force. Uh, we have worked with some of our national partners because the issues, as Carl will explain, uh, the health issues are very similar with a train, a passenger rail car, and a Greyhound bus or a municipal bus. So um, I, I just wanna thank the department for allowing us to use their phone line um, and for the meetings we've had. We have had four conference calls. Three of the calls are been with DOT. Two of the calls of those three have been with the FTA. We will be doing another call. It won't be related to passenger rail as much as non-emergency medical transportation. We formed uh, quite a coalition. For those of you who know me, uh, know I believe uh, strongly in three things and our coalition reflects that. Uh, and that is cooperation, uh, communications, and coordination. And that's where we fit into that. A run is a major player at DOT, and therefore they all have to work together on these things. And this is very strictly related to the effects of the virus on transportation. I also want to thank uh, WISARP. Uh, uh, all Aboard Wisconsin is registered to lobby. And we have a committee as part of us that was uh, funded through uh, the efforts of Andy Hauk and his SMART team. We have a Wisconsin uh, Freight and Passenger Rail Committee, which looks at issues that can best be described as one rail. So, you know, you know many of you know that philosophy of trying to work with the freight rail companies. We have succeeded. We have invited the first class railroads to some of our meetings. But I wanted to thank WISARP, which prepares an incredibly good newsletter, which is used by us very faithfully, uh, publication after publication, uh, either Nona or Clark or I or Dave Muma go to the basement of the Capitol and those get delivered. I have had at least a dozen legislators say they love that newsletter and it is, uh, I just wanna thank them for, um, uh, for doing that. Also, we believe in communicating in the Capitol. So in the last year, in August of 2019, we held a briefing in the North Hearing Room of the Capitol. Some 60 people uh, were there. Terry Brown even talked about the Twin Cities, Milwaukee, Chicago issues. And then in March of 2020, before the virus shut everything down, we did a legislative day in the Capitol. So we are, we are politically involved, just so you all know, that's our goal. I'm glad to see Scott on the call. Senator Miller was uh, honored and I'm glad to see that committee, that commission continuing very, very important for all of us. Um, we also honored Ed Brooks, a Republican from the Baraboo area who passed away. And we, uh, we work uh, very closely with, with the members of the transportation committees in the legislature. I want to point out a couple of things uh, and then um, be cognizant of the time. 
Uh, these are observations of mine. They are about what we're in right now. Uh, this is a very, very difficult political time. Uh, there are 86 competitive assembly races in the state. Each one of them is filled with uh, some of the most vile messaging back and forth between supporters of various candidates. It is uh, pretty ugly out there in the field. Uh, and so we have to be very careful to stick to the merits of the issue. Uh, but I wanted to point out a few, uh, few things that I think are impactful. Five I was called um, by a group of people uh, years ago. I chaired the education committee. Uh, I am happy to say that Governor Tommy Thompson, this is a factor, will be taking over as president on an interim basis, although the internship will last more than a year and a half. He is moving into the chancellor's house at Mad in Madison. Uh, and of course, remember, he was chairman of Amtrak. And I had a chance to talk to him and say, some of your campuses formed uh, committees that dealt with student transportation and the need for passenger rail to some of the campuses. All Aboard Wisconsin's first community forum was held in uh, kind of a jail area of the Sheriff's Department, Winnebago County, and the university sent two people there who talked about the need for students to have better transportation. Um, secondly, you should know that our Governor Evers and Governor Waltz of Minnesota are good friends, that they had developed a relationship before either of them became governor. Please keep that in mind because they have mentioned it to me time after time, uh, a couple of times. Uh, also, um, uh, you have the emergence of Ron Kind as a member of Congress who is taking a far more active role. And because of the spread of his district, almost all the way up to St. Croix, all the way down to La Crosse, his level of interest in rail has gone up and he has communicated with our office uh, about supporting bills in Congress. He's taken a far more active uh, role in this. Okay. And finally, I wanna mention um, as we will coordinate with campaigns uh, and educating legislators, again, using those newsletters and other information that people, uh, that all of you have been involved in like Mark Quam and others, is that um, we will, we will con the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, is a candidate for president. And of course, there are many people who think of him and think of Amtrak in the same uh, mind. So we, those are all factors that are seeping into this, but we will continue to uh, be very active uh, in educating and informing our friends in the legislature. Carl will explain the role and some of the topics that the committee has done. And Andy uh, Hauk, of course, SMART is on our board of directors. They are a very active partner in this and they are, at, they are impacted by all of this tremendously. So I'm glad that they could join the call today, Ron, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and you can go to the next person. All right, thank you very much, Gary. Our next person.